It's March, and light returns to the high Arctic, sweeping away four months of darkness. A polar bear stirs. She has been in her den the whole winter. Her emergence marks the beginning of spring. After months of confinement underground, she toboggans down the slope, perhaps to clean her fur, perhaps for sheer joy. gaze out of their bright new world for the very first time. The female calls them, but this steep slope is not the easiest place to take your first steps. But they are hungry and eager to reach their mother, who's delayed feeding them on this special day. Now she lures them with the promise of milk, the only food the cubs have known since they were born, deaf and blind beneath the snow some two months ago. Their mother has not eaten for five months and has lost half her body weight. Now she converts the last of her fat reserves into milk for her cubs. The spring sun brings warmth, but also a problem for the mother. It starts to melt the sea ice. That is where she hunts for the seals she needs to feed her cubs, and she must get there before the ice breaks up. For now, though, it's still minus 30 degrees, and the cubs must have the shelter of the den. a male red-sided garter snake. He survived the winter by hibernating underground, where the temperature never dropped below zero. The weak sun persuades more males to emerge. They're cold and can't move fast, yet they are in an urgent race. The first males to warm up will have a head start when the first females appear. Meltwater provides the first drink they've had for six months. At last, a female has emerged. The warmest males will inevitably be the first to react to her smell. She will only mate once, so competition between them is intense. This male has overslept. He will need hours to warm up. At the moment, 
he stands no chance of mating. Most of the other males are ready to chase females, but curiously, some leave the race and go to join the cold male. They slide their warm bodies over him, just as they would if they were courting a female. More and more males crowd round him. Why? Their relative temperatures show what's going on. His cool body showing as blue is quickly warming as it absorbs heat from the other males. He's a trickster. He's fooled the others by giving off a scent just like a female's, and they are trying to mate with him. He only needs a few minutes of this to steal enough heat from his rivals to catch up and join the chase. Every spring, tens of thousands of garter snakes fight it out in this mating frenzy. It is, in numbers, the greatest gathering of reptiles in the world. And it seems that our male from the camera trap has picked up a scent and found himself a female. Due to his small size, this male wouldn't normally have a chance to mate. This female seems impatient, and our male doesn't have to be asked twice. His small size causes a few logistical problems. But with persistence and the odd leg up, finally he succeeds. Um. Mating over, the female grooms the young male. With no yearlings around, she can afford to spend time with her man. Spring climbs the mountains. Hibernation isn't something an animal just wakes up from. Even after surviving here for seven months, if the transition from oblivion to action isn't exactly right, the marmot could die. It needs what's left of its fat stores to heat its heart and blood. The warmed heart beats faster. Warm blood flows first to the critical areas, and then to the whole body. It's a quick system, but it takes almost all of what's left of the marmot's energy. If it takes more than what's left, the marmot never wakes up. Half the youngsters don't wake up, but most of the adults do, their bodies around a third lighter than when winter began. They're ravenously hungry, but they hardly eat for at least a week, the time it takes to rebuild their gut lining.
And because they use so much energy just waking up, some don't last that week. Awake and amid the spring vegetation, they starve. Because there are so few Vancouver Island marmots, every survivor is important for the species. Understanding how hibernation works is important too. It may help save them. Every spring, the male alligators put on a spectacular mating display. They sink down in the water so their backs are just below the surface and make really low frequency sounds. And the consequence of that is that water droplets on their back look like they're dancing. And it soon becomes a water dance-off as rival males compete by displaying to females. I've never really had any desire to be close to a bellowing alligator, but I do want to see this. And to do it, I've got to trigger a chorus of amorous alligators. To see this spectacle, Helen needs to encourage some alligators to start dancing. And to do this, she needs to replicate their infrasonic calls. So they think there's a larger male close by. And that requires speakers even bigger than a camper van. These speakers produce sounds of 19 hertz, the same deep frequency as the alligators bellow at. So let's see if they can entice a grumpy alligator to start flirting. So that's it. Those are the big infrasound speakers sending sound out over the lake here. And now we just have to wait and see if any of the alligators react. straight over there, tail up in the air, getting ready to call. There are two parts to this display. A deep bellow from their mouths. It's like hearing dinosaurs. And the water dance. Although we can't hear it, these alligators are actually producing a very low frequency hum. And this causes water droplets to bounce off their backs. For these ancient predators, this elaborate display is essential for attracting mates. But how do they make the water dance? Just using sound. Footage from our high-speed camera reveals their secret. The alligator's back is just below the surface of the water. As it begins to bellow, its entire body vibrates. And its back acts like a piston driving the surface of the water into a dramatic splashing display. It's thought that alligators have been calling like this for at least 70 million years. One such place is the Sea of Okuts in far eastern Russia. This is the island of Talan. Throughout the long Arctic winter, it's encircled by ice. 
But as spring approaches, that begins to break up, and seabirds that have spent the winter feeding out on the open ocean far to the south begin to return. Its isolated position and steep cliffs make Talan a perfect nesting site. The tufted puffins arrive first. These are the Pacific cousins of our less spectacular Atlantic species. Horn puffins soon follow. In all, 14 different species return to Talan each spring, and in just a few weeks, the once silent cliffs come alive to the calls of four million breeding seabirds. This is a multi-story avian city. Assembling in these dense colonies, after having spent a largely solitary life at sea, provides the birds with the social stimulation that is the key to coordinating their breeding. By nesting and laying together, they ensure that most of their chicks will leave the nest at exactly the same time. Just like the turtles, this is the way they spread the impact of predators. The world's largest eagle, Stella's sea eagle, a third as big again as a golden. Throughout the summer, the eagles hunt in Talan's crowded colonies. Riding on the updrafts, they patrol the top of the cliffs, looking out for any kittiwake that ventures too far from the rock face. Suddenly, the huge eagle stoops with the aerial agility of a falcon. Coordinating panic among the kittiwakes confuses their attacker. But the eagle doesn't give up. And it has got one. Catching insects one by one takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. And very few creatures that feed that way can get enough to build and sustain big bodies. But some insect eaters early in their history, about 40 million years ago, solved that problem by broadening their diet. And one of their descendants lives right here in my garden in London. And I can tempt it out with a wide variety of food, including, for example, minced meat. The hedgehog is still very much a creature of the night, but it's too big to hide in the leaf litter. That makes it vulnerable to attack from animals like foxes. To make up for this, its hairs have become a cloak of prickles. And if it thinks it's in real danger, it's got a special trick. The hedgehog will stay an impregnable spiny ball like this until it decides that danger has passed.
But one thing is guaranteed to make a male hedgehog drop his guard, the promise of an amorous liaison. If you're outside on a spring evening, you may be lucky enough to witness an extraordinary sight. You might think that having a coat of spines on your back would be something of a handicap when it comes to the intimacies of courtship. And indeed, classical naturalists thought that hedgehogs actually mated belly to belly. The male noses the female's spines, which seems to excite her. Although, as far as he's concerned, it does look rather painful. Whether the female flattens her prickles to help the male is unclear, but it does seem that the old joke that asks how do hedgehogs mate was right all along. The answer is, of course, with great care. Even though only 1% of the original pine forest remains, writer Jim Crumley can still feel humbled in its presence. Pine woods are, I mean, to my way of thinking, are completely different from any other kind of wood. Especially big pine woods, like you get around the Cairngorms, where you really do get the chance to you know, go for a long walk in, in trees. And there is a sense at the beginning of, you know, as you enter the pine wood, that it sort of says to me, walk more slowly, you know, walk softer, look at where you are, you know, take notice. Sheltered in the woods from the fickle weather, Jim can easily lose sense of time. Under a tree like this, he had his first encounter with one of the rarest and shyest creatures of the pine forest. I was lying just on the ground, and I probably hadn't been in a deep sleep, but uh, I would have been dozing. And there was this capercaillie making this preposterous noise. and it just started to bitterly parade up and down and these strange kind of popping cork noises started and it was extraordinary to encounter it for the first time in such a situation. Capercaillie, or capers, are only found in pine forests where they feed on the pine needles and shoots. It's in April when the males head towards a special place in the forest known as a lek, a Norse word for dance. I kind of followed it as best I could, crawling on my stomach, and got to the edge of the, this little clearing, and there were three or four others there. It was kind of into this big black fan thing. It's like a black sunrise. It's one of the most extraordinary things in nature. The object of the exercise, obviously, is to attract the females. And that whole thing, that kind of joy of discovery thing, is what absolutely, for me, underpins um, you know, everything that I do in the natural world. It was a rare moment indeed. There is so little native forest. There are fewer than 2,000 capercaillie left. Reluctantly, the chicks take a few nervous steps 
towards the edge. Encouraged by a gentle nudge, he leaps into the unknown. Dad follows right behind him, reassuringly calling to his chick. Made it. The landings may not be stylish, but at least they're on target. It's easy to misjudge the distance, and some fall short of the water. But even now, Dad sticks close by. He encourages his chick to take the last few steps towards the safety of the waves. But some chicks land a long way from the water. They're sturdy enough to survive the fall, but this is no place to be left alone. For the mother fox, it's easy pickings. With so many free meals falling from the sky, she runs from one kill to the next. The chicks will be jumping for only three days, so she must make the most of this bonanza. The survival of her own family depends on it. With more chicks than she can possibly carry, the mother fox has to be clever. What her family can't eat now, she buries. For the days ahead, she'll have a well-stocked larder, enough for all eight of her cubs. <laughs> 